How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Well, I'm not here every day, but I'm here today. Thursday here in this program. I feel like death. But I am here, and I'm going to talk about all these shows here today. No, I don't have COVID. I took another test today. What I have is two kids. These vectors. Everybody's gotten it. I was the last holdout. Now I have it. But you know what? I'm back here today. Mostly because I don't know where Mike is. He's probably not going to be here today. But anyway, who cares? We got a lot to get into today. We have, uh, you know what I was most sad about yesterday missing the show was I couldn't do the NXT report. So maybe I'll talk about it a little bit today. If not, you'll have to wait till the Brian and Vinny show tonight. But we have got AEW Dynamite from last night. A big show that was weird. There was some good wrestling and a hot crowd. And then there was whatever that last 45 minutes or so was. So we'll talk about that. And uh, we'll talk about the ratings for the NXT Spring Break-In show. We'll talk about uh, non-spoiler Rampage for Friday. We've got uh, tickets going on sale for shows. We have got uh, an AEW power failure. And it actually affected the dark elevation tapings, but did not affect the main show, thankfully. And uh, New Japan. New Japan Strong this week was supposed to be a... Uh, a special two-hour episode, and boy, was I not happy about that. There's so much stuff that i got to watch every week. I did not need two hours of New Japan Strong. And the wrestling gods heard my plea. They probably thought, this poor bastard's sick. Let's give this guy a break. So instead, it's going to be split into two shows. So uh, two one-hour shows, everything's back to normal. And uh, we got a lot more to get into, so let's do this, everybody. Let's get it on! Wrestling Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Let's do a little bit of news here, then we'll get going today. And then I'm going to tap out. You know what I did before the show? I napped. I never Me too. Napped. Yeah, I know. All right, the spring break in edition of NXT, 661,000 viewers on the USA Network, up 14.6% from last week. Highest viewership number the show's done since January 4th. 33rd on the cable charts, 0. 0.13 and 18 to 49. Obviously, the NBA playoff did very, very well. And uh, Special had a big increase with females, up 75% from last week. People over 50, up 21% which was the main reason for the viewership increase. The average age of an NXT viewer remains like 60, 62 years old or whatever. And uh, I don't think I'm going to review all of NXT. I know Mike did it yesterday, but I later later on, if I have time, i got to make a point here. And I'm actually not even sure I can make on national radio, but I'm going to try anyway. So that take was the more, NXT numbers. Take more cold medicine before you do it. It ought to make it entertaining. Oh, dude, I'm already in a mood. I already had one guy banned from the chat for just... Well, I can I'm tell. I mean, today. look the way you started this show. Oh, Mike going to be here? He probably won't be here. Well, who cares? <laughs> I'll remember that, you bastard. I didn't mean who cares. Like, you're not going to uh, be here. I'm, I'm like, who cares about anything right now? Just get this show done. AEW suffered a power failure during Dark Elevation on Wednesday. Two matches scheduled for the show were unable to be filmed. Uh, the problem <laughs> Unfortunately, started it was not the Dynamite main event. <laughs> during a match between Cheeseburger and Max Caster continued as Nyla Rose faced Sky Blue. The entrance, the announcing place, all of a sudden everything went dark. They did the match. Max Caster won. These, it's okay to give you spoilers to everybody because you're never going to see the match. <laughs> it's not going to air. It wasn't taped. So Max Caster won, and they did another match. And they, they announced the match is only for you fans in the arena. It will never air. So I think I'm all right giving the spoilers for those two. Am I not? And then uh, the power came back on. So, you know, things happen. Did Max Caster cut a blue promo? Did he take that opportunity to go all Luther Campbell and, and curse somebody out? I don't know. I don't know. We'll never know. We'll never know. And then New Japan has announced a change of plans for this Sunday's episode of Strong. So Strong was going to be a two-hour show. 
two hours. You guys realize there's a WWE uh, pay-per-view this weekend? You probably don't realize that because it's like the worst build to a pay-per-view in a long time. But uh, there's a WWE pay-per-view this weekend, a UFC pay-per-view, and Stardom was last night, which I have to watch for the filthy show. And I don't need two hours of strong. I'm sorry. And uh, thankfully, it's not anymore. They split into two shows. So this Saturday, it's Tom Lawler, J.R. Kratos, and Royce Isaacs versus Fred Ross or Alex Coglin in the DKC. Jonah versus Blake Christian. And Hikaleo and Chris Bay versus Bateman and Barrett Brown. And then next week, we've got Jay White versus Hikaleo. Fred Rosser uh, versus Royce Isaacs and Jarrell Nelson. Handicap match. And uh, Rocky Romero, Adrian Quest, and Alex Coglin face J.R. Kratos, Black Tiger, and Danny Limelight. Hmm. Was there a philosophy as to why this thing was going to be two hours because of the Philly and D.C. shows? I mean... I don't know. Hmm. No clue. Well, they actually they made the right decision, to be honest, so... Yeah, they did make the right decision. So that's the news, everybody. I guess those Forbidden Door tickets went on sale and blasted away. So that's nice. And, uh, guys, what do you want out of me? What do you want out of me here? Oh, my. You know what? I'm going to make a, I'm going to, I'm going to do a, I know everyone's like furious about this, but just bros, chill out. I'll do, I'll do AEW when I have a full segment. But since we got a few extra minutes here, okay, I got to make mention of something from, from NXT. Okay. It's not even a segment. So just listen. Bros. Okay. I realize that you know you know who's in charge of NXT right now is 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 Shawn Michaels, but I can't blame him because this is, I don't think this is coming from him. But you know he's a nice Christian man, probably doesn't go on a lot of porn sites, right? In that theory, I should probably ask Craig. But so I'm watching this NXT show. You might see another Shawn Michaels, and they're doing this segment with uh, J.C. Jane and Gigi Dolan, and they're at the beach. And they're practically, they got no clothes on. And they're doing this segment, and they're running around and, you know, spilling out everywhere. And we, we just had that interview with Ember Moon where they were told to dress more like Mandy Rose. And Mandy Rose is, is the champion. And they're always out there posing, and she's always in her, her outfits and everything like that. And, uh, bro... There's no young people that watch this show. There aren't any. The average, this show is, is the viewership is so old, okay? Viewership so old Hold it on. makes us look young. Hold on. <laughs> now, uh, you know, it's like, I was, I was actually, you know what I was going to do is I was going to have you, I'm not going to do this because it's just like, I, I can't bring myself to do it. <laughs> oh, but yeah, I was gonna have, what is it? I was going to have you name a type. And then I was going to see how quickly I could find that type nude on the internet. Okay. Okay. It would take me. You could name brunette, uh, you whatever. Okay. It take it take me, and it's not just me. It's anyone listening to this right now. It's going to take you two seconds to find an example of someone that looks like this nude. Probably do it a lot more than just being nude on the internet. Okay, bros. It's 2022. Okay. Your idea to get young viewers is to put women in bikinis on television. Brother, guys, like, I'm, I, I can't believe it. It's not going to work. Bro, if anybody wants to see good-looking women, or men for that matter, wearing a lot less than anyone's wearing on NXT, it's two seconds on the internet, Okay. This ain't going to work. Now, let's move away from pulchritude. You guys know what yesterday was? It was, uh, it was May 4th, okay? Some of you nerds probably have heard, May the 4th be with you. It's Star Wars Day, okay? Now, I'm one of those nerds now because my daughter loves Star Wars, all right? So my daughter's, like, totally in all this Star Wars stuff. But I don't, want her, I don't want her watching a movie where some guy's getting his hand chopped off with a lightsaber. So I try to find everything I can that a kid could watch, all right? So one of the things I found the other day... No, so just, let's just bear with me. One of the things I found the other day was a documentary about the making of Star Wars, okay? 
and they're interviewing George Lucas, who was the guy that created Star Wars, and he's talking about film studios in the in the late sixties and the early seventies. Now everything was changing, okay, and all the old people. Does this sound familiar? All the old people were retiring, okay, from these studios. These studios were being sold. You know what George Lucas says? He goes, they discovered that what young people wanted was movies made by other young people. Huh. So you're telling me, you're telling me what young people wanted was movies made by other young people. And meanwhile, we've got, you know, NXT is just one example, but we've also got WWE, which I know everybody thinks nobody but children watches WWE. Bro, there ain't no children watching WWE. It's also all old people. And yeah, AEW, there's a lot of older people as well. But I mean, at least we're talking, you know, late 40s, not 60s. And what we've got here is wrestling booked by old people tv shows created by old people nxt old people running this show and all they can come up with to get young people is not young people booking the show oh let's just put random women in bikinis that'll work well it's not it's time for a change i think everybody knows what it is back in a moment observer live i right, one last thing to say that i'm moving on so don't jump in mike let's just move on to aw I am not anti-old, okay? If I had a billion dollars and I started a wrestling company, I'd hire Shawn Michaels maybe before anybody else. And you know what? I'd hire Vince, too. I wouldn't have him book, but I'd ask him, like, what do you think about this or that? I mean, the guy's been doing this for a million years. But my point is, if you want to attract a young viewer, then the person writing the shows in their late 70s probably is going to have a hard time. All right. A.W. Dynamite. The show was uh, a mix of highs and lows, brother. Owen Hart, Bobby Fish, or Owen Hart Foundation Cup qualifier, Jeff Hardy and Bobby Fish, was a, uh, it was a weird match. Jeff Hardy looks like he is in tons of pain, and he is slow. But the fans love this dude. And, like, every time he did one of his high spots, they went crazy. Every time he teased anything, they went crazy. He had this the senton, they went crazy. And he won! And then the Young Bucks came out, and they, uh, they had a moment with the Hardys, and then they moved on to check on Bobby Fish. And uh, from watching Jeff move around, I mean, if we're going to do this match in AEW, let's do it quick. So, I think that match is coming here pretty soon. We had a fabulous William Regal video package this was so awesome training this poor bloke wheeler yuda and then uh brian daniels and john moxley wheeler yuda beat the butcher the blade and angelico i don't care what happened during picture in picture okay on television they ruined these guys they smashed them they pummeled them they bloked them all up and then they uh did the triple submission and uh danielson triangled as uh, regal calls him Angelico and got the win. So they're getting the big push here. And we got to talk about uh, rankings later, okay? Don't let me forget, Mike. We had Ricky Starks and Powerhouse Hobbs at meeting with uh, Jungle Boy, Luchasaurus, Christian Cage. And Jungle Boy said, listen, you guys want a tag title match? We've been thinking about it, and we will give it to you. But on the condition that I get a shot at a Ricky Starks FTW title next week. So that's on. Wardlow came out. Fans are absolutely so into this Wardlow bloke. He comes out. He gets in the ring. And, yes, they bring out W. Morrissey, the former big Cass. And he's seven feet tall, as promised. And you can't teach that. And he gets in the ring, and he's pummeling old Wardlow. And fans are are chanting for Wardlow. They're actually chanting... Uh, we want Enzo, no we don't, and Big Cass also does not want Enzo. He's screaming at these fans to just shut up about this little nerd. <laughs> and uh, finally, Wardlow makes a comeback. Big Moonsault power bombs him once and pins him. And then they send out, uh, I'm not joking here, 20 security guys hit the ring. 
Wardlow kills every single one of them. And he tells MGF he's not going to quit till he gets his match. And, and MGF says, all right, fine. I will give you the match, but only under certain conditions. And I'm not giving you geeks in this town the conditions. You will have to tune in next week in Long Island. We'll do a contract signing. I laughed. And I'll give you the, uh, the conditions there. His gimmick is that he's ready to go to WWE. So all of this is heat. We had a uh, segment setting up uh, Rampage with the women, which I'll, uh, I'll have old Fauntleroy. God, I, I could use Fauntleroy for this whole show here today. Hangman Page did a promo. And uh, Hangman Page, I don't know if he's fully turning heel because he's done a few kind of sort of heelish things over the last couple of months, but this was like, he's all in for this feud with Punk. He's not going to be doing these masturbatory Bret Hart tribute matches. He's not going to go in there and shake this guy's hand. And he's not going to talk about how excited he is to be. He's going to go in there and he's going to kill this guy. And he goes, you, if you've got your CM Punk shirt, by the time this match is over, you're going to be burning that thing. And uh, he says, Punk's not here tonight. He's out making some movie. He's, he's playing the, uh, um, I guess, Roman Reigns role actually, when Brock Lesnar was never there. And he says Punk's going to get the fight of his life at Double it's Like Earth. John Cena and The Rock? Basically, yeah. He's playing John Cena to The Rock here. Except uh, I think John Cena was supposed to be a, a baby face. Actually, right? you know what? CM Punk and The Rock. Wasn't that CM Punk's big thing actually, with The Rock yeah. as well, too? Kind of was the same thing, yeah. <laughs> Jericho and Santana had a match. And, uh, dude, they got to be building towards this uh, War Games because, my God, there's interference. It was like a Bullet Club match early, and it was a Bullet Club match late. Everybody is getting involved. The uh, Appreciation Society's out there, and uh, there's actually uh, the only person out there uh, for uh, uh, Santana's Ortiz because Eddie King's got his eyeball burned off. And so uh ends up with distraction there at the end. Jericho hits a low blow. Judas Effect gets the win. They beat both guys down afterwards. Fans are waiting for Eddie, but there's no Eddie. He'll be back, though. What is he, a cartoon? He burned it off. He didn't burn it out. He didn't burn the eye. He just burned it right off his face. Well, I don't know what he did. I'm just saying that. I don't have an update on his eyeball condition. We had, oh, my God, this is where the show started to fall off. Varsity Blondes uh, come out, and poor Brian Pillman cuts a promo, and nobody cares. And you know the, you know the problem. Uh, you know what? I'm gonna just finish the report, and I'll talk more about this in a while. But anyway, out come uh, the House of Black, and they uh, attack Pillman and Garrison, and uh, you know they're expecting Julia Hart to turn and hit him with a chair, but she doesn't. And so they intimidate her, and they make her cry, and they rip off her eye patch, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting. And nothing comes of it. And then they actually go to a uh, backstage segment with Jade Cargill, and they come back, and she's still in the ring, and it's a uh, Ray Phoenix versus Dante Martin match. So, like, the fact that she was still in the ring after the break, and she's covering her eye, so we don't see what's, what you know, she's clearly got the eye gimmick that uh, um, Malachi has, but they're they're teasing this forever. But she's still out there. And so I thought, okay, well... You know, she's going to blow that mist if Ray Phoenix cost him the match. But no, she vanished. And we never saw her again. And so Ray Phoenix and Dante Martin, it's like, I'll talk about this match later too. But, uh, like, if you want to see the most incredible moves you ever saw, if I got the match for you, but, like, as a match, it wasn't even a match at all. It was like a, a hey, you do a crazy move. And then I'll do a crazy move. And then you do one. And the crowd's going crazy. So, like, I, I have a lot to say about this. But uh, anyway, uh, Ray Phoenix won. And so he moves on in the tournament. So here are the brackets for the tournament. Uh, the tournament matches are, uh, yeah, it was Cirque du Soleil. Ray Phoenix versus Kyle O'Reilly. Jeff Hardy versus Darby Allen, Adam Cole versus Dax Harwood. And Samoa Joe versus The Joker. Who could The Joker be? Hmm. I know who I think it is. I don't think it's Kenny Omega. 
But uh, we'll get into that. Then we had a Thunder Rosa promo. My God. So it wasn't even so much the promo, but like how much time did they devote to this? She's out there talking forever, and nobody cares. And then she calls out Serena Deeb, and Serena Deeb comes out, and she starts talking forever, and nobody cares. I didn't think it was really bad. It certainly would have been a lot better shorter, and it would have been a lot better if people cared. Uh, but they set up the match at double or nothing, and, uh, and you know I'm watching the clock, and it's like, dude, we got a, a unification match still to come, and these two are still talking. And they talked, and they talked, and they talked. And I thought, you know, we're running out of time. Maybe they're not going to plug the matches for next week. But they did. And, uh, and, you know, Excalibur's no longer going 3,000 miles an hour. So they, they take us through the Rampage lineup, and they take us through the Dynamite lineup, and they, you know, they just took their time. And I'm like, dude, we are running low here. And then they go backstage for John Silver. Johnny Hungy does a promo. And they're taking their time. So by the time Mercedes and Deanna got in the ring, they have nine minutes of TV time left. Nine. And the bell rings. And uh, the first thing Deanna does, she backs off. She listens to the crowd. And then they slowly begin to circle each other. Da, da, da. I'm like, what is happening? And then the announcers are like, we're going to stay here as long as it takes. And I'm thinking, do they actually really get an overrun for one? Because they always say that, but they never actually go past the top of the hour. And, bro, they are lo- they are working a match like they're going to go 20. And I'm looking at my watch, and it's like, bro, there's <laughs> there's no time left. They go to commercial. They come back. There's six minutes left. And, uh, and you know, the match, like... Deanna's a really good worker, and and but the, nobody cared about this match at all, and uh, and finally the it, literally the the last second with moments left, uh, Mercedes Martinez curb stomps her and she goes for the dragon sleeper. And at least everybody knew the dragon sleeper because they actually woke up for that like ah, and then uh, Deanna taps, and Mercedes gets the belt. She holds them up. They're off the air. So I understand that like two belts on the line. They wanted to make this a big main event. They wanted to give respect to the titles. Fans did not see it that way at all. So last 45 minutes of this show, yikes. I expected to uh, die a death in the quarters, but I've been wrong before about that. We'll talk more about specific segments after the break, Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Summer Vivi, also WrestlingObserver.com. Let's get this uh, font right thing over with today. Don't give me any crap today, you know. Doctor, Brit Baker, DMD is Perluet, Jamie Hater vers. Wow! Speaking the Deutsch? Absolute idiot. Huh. I want in Dutch, you moron. I said Deutsch, German. I'm not talking idiot. about you, I'm talking about that other moron. You're all idiots. Let's try this again. Jiminy Christmas. Dr. Brit Baker, on? DMD and Jamie Hater versus Tony Storm and Ruby Soho. Kanosuke Takashida vs. Jay Lethal. Hook vs. J.D. Drake. Owen Hart Foundation Cup Qualifier. Riho vs. Yuka Sakazaki. I hope you feel better soon, Daddy. Don't even start that. What was you I going to talk about on this show? I'm going to talk about something on this show. What did I want to get into? You had a bunch of things that you decided to put off until this third segment here. I did. Which, you know anything why? Anything in particular I'm a, that you I'm a professional, and I, I got the timing perfect for the entire... Uh... <laughs> oh, yeah. I did. Jesus Christ. I literally ended the review right as the music hit, because I'm a, I'm a pro. You didn't have a time to write. No, I actually did. I had mm-hmm. to have a time perfectly, thank you. Yeah, uh-huh. All right. I actually did. Do you want me to rewind the show? Jesus. Dom, did I not have that time perfectly with the music? You did. There were like two seconds left. Thank you. Oh, will you kiss that? You. Oh, my I mean, it's God. not like it didn't you know happen and everyone heard it. I think I'm going to take the day off tomorrow. I'm feeling ill right now having to do this show with you. I'm, I'm starting to catch the vapors through the internet here from you. Vapors? Um, yeah, whatever it is you got. All right, so this uh, Julia Hart thing. Guys, I don't know what's going on here. Well, I mean, I know what's going on. Here, here's the thing. They take their time, okay? 
and they're clearly taking their time with this one here. But this segment, I mean, it starts out with Brian Pillman doing a promo, and absolutely nobody cares about this guy's promo. And you know part of the problem is? Which actually brings me back to NXT 2.0. He's not over in the way people want him to be? No. This spooky stuff sucks. Okay? It sucks. You guys remember Bray Wyatt? I know, yeah. you know, I had one guy who was all mad. He was like, Bray Wyatt was the most over guy. Bro, he was not the most over guy in the company. I don't care if he sold some shirts, bro. If this guy was the most over guy and the biggest merchandise seller and the biggest, all of that, you don't fire that guy, okay? They took him off TV and they fired him, all right? Then, who was the female fiend? Alexa Bliss. Where's she? Oh, she's nowhere to be seen. Then we got, uh, what's his face on NXT? Joe Gacy. He's the new spooky guy. You guys seen the quarter hours for Joe Gacy's stuff? Bro. Collapsing. And nobody cared about Joe Gacy and Braun Breaker on Wednesday. I don't care about some of you that like the, this. The, the greater audience does not care about this spooky stuff. And, bro, when poor Brian Pillman has to go out there and he has to do the line about how, uh, how, how did he describe, he was like, they, her life force has been, what did he say about Julia Hart? Anybody? He said something about how, you know, something spooky had happened to her and it had sucked out her life force or something. She's standing there all sullen and like nobody cares about the spooky. Okay. So he's doing this promo and nobody cares. And then he gets all fired up. And I thought when he got fired up, he actually did a decent promo. He got all, he's all, I'm turn my life around and uh, let's, let's do this. So he calls out the house of black. So the House of Black come out, and they get in the ring, okay? And they're in the ring, and Brian Pillman Jr. and Griff Garrison are there, and Pillman's got his fists up, and he's just challenged them to a fight. So he challenged them, they show up, and he just stands there. And finally, the House of Black's like, all right, fine. And they beat the heck out of this guy and his buddy. And, and I'm like, God, this poor guy looks like such a geek right now. And they pummel him and they pummel him and they beat him down. And then, you know, I think, you know, all the fans are expecting that Julia Hart's going to turn. But she's still with Pillman and Garrison. So it's not even like, you know, I was waiting. When they're standing there with their fists up, I was expecting her to do the double low blow or something. And that would be the big turn. But she didn't. And so then now it's not even like it's going to be a surprise. The House of Black just goes up to her and they give her a chair. So she gets the chair and she's standing over and she raises the chair over her head. And then she puts it down. And then Malachi Black, he like goes over and he starts yelling at her and she starts. And I'm thinking back to all these horrible angles they did with women in WWE back in the day where like they humiliate the women and Trish Stratus barking like a dog and and three minute warning or whatever and they're just they're just she's crying and they're intimidating her and she's oh, and no one's saving her and then malachi rips the thing off and man, she just covers her face and i'm like this is very uncomfortable what's the point point? and i'm waiting and i'm waiting and then it's just like well we're gonna go to the back for an interview with uh jade cargill I'm like, okay. And then when they came back, she's she's still there. She's still covering her eye. And so I'm thinking something's got to happen, and nothing happens. This was, man, talk about a swing and a miss. I mean, this was like a swing and a miss. It was a horrible segment. It was, I mean, it was uncomfortable. It was horrible. You know, I wasn't. It's I, gone on for six months. Well, Six yeah, but I mean, months. Wardlow went on for almost two with years a bunch and it of people worked. With the, because they were far more over than Brian Pillman and Griff Garrison are. They're yeah. not even close to being over. You debut the House of Black, you set it up, you get you get Brody King in there, you get Buddy Matthews in there, and it's looking like it's going to be fine. 
And then they're off TV for God knows how long. They're well, they're doing dark or they're on elevation. And it looks like we're going to get this storyline. It seems like it's coming to a head and then it just disappears. How do you expect anybody to want to care about this? It has not been consistently in anybody's wheelhouse as a viewer. It came, it went. It, the last time everybody was in the ring together, I don't think anybody really cared. They didn't get revenge. They didn't avenge the girl. She just ended up sitting there moping on the steps where she could have just remained for this entire time. The whole angle has sucked. The whole story has sucked. And you bring it and you pull it back and you bring it and you pull it back. Either crap or get off the pot, as the old saying goes with this. Either have a coherent storyline for multiple weeks that's on TV. You see it to a conclusion. You try to get people involved. If it's not working, then cut it short. Or you move it and you fix it or you do whatever you need to do. They did none of that here. It just disappeared when it really wasn't working in the first place. And then bring it back and it's like... We're supposed to expect anybody to care. Brian Pillman's not electric on the microphone. Griff Garrison's invisible on the microphone. They're invisible as a team on the main roster. Julia Hart and their situation hasn't been figured out. And then you have the House of Black that's sitting there with all of this talent. People can tolerate a little bit of spooky out of the House of Black if they're getting these guys in feuds that actually fit the level that they're at which they're absolutely not getting. The whole thing has blown. And to put it on the House of Black all, you can't really do that. And about the spooky, because it's really not the spooky in this case. It's how they told the story. It's well, hold on, hold on. How they've told the whole story and how they've presented these people. It absolutely is. Well, listen, it is partly the spooky, because every week, every week, not every week, but on most weeks, Malachi Black does the spooky promo backstage, and they're in the shadows, and you don't know what they're talking about, and it's whatever. And, bro, I never, I'm sure, listen. But Brian, I, Kevin hold on, Sullivan hold on. Did this. Out, of, out, of a million, this out, out of a million viewers, I'm sure some people love the Malachi Black promos. But all of the feedback that I get is always, I don't know what he's talking about. I don't care. I just want them to wrestle. Okay. Am I wrong? That's what everybody says about it. Can we just have let them says? have matches? Nobody cares about the spooky promos. I'm not wrong about this. Now, somebody did ask. All right, it was it was not even asked. I didn't like, say that. What I said was they can handle a little spooky as long as it's being balanced out by the other stuff people want to see out of these guys. Yeah, I don't even think we need any spooky, but fine. You can if you want a little spooky, that's fine. But someone was like, trust the process. Listen. The Wardlow thing that I brought up, the process worked, okay? And you know what? They do long, slow builds for a lot of those storylines. And I actually believe, okay, I do believe. But you got to build it. Well, hold on. There's a Well, big they are difference. building it, but this is my point. I do I'd believe. Obviously with that one. I do believe when they pull the trigger on Julie Hart, the place is going to go nuts, okay? I do believe that's going to happen. But I have seen. <laughs> does it sustain? It does not always work. Uh, the, the one example I'll give, which is not even AEW, but years ago when uh, they had, um, uh, what's his name, uh, R- Ricardo Rodriguez. Uh, yeah. was He's got what 85 if, different names. Ricardo, yeah, it was Ricardo. No, but who was he managing? Is this guy's name? Alberto. Alberto. Alberto Del Rio. It was Alberto Del Rio at the time, not El Patron, whatever. Whatever. Anyway, the point is, so Alberto was a heel, okay? And uh, they always wanted him. They they wanted another great Hispanic baby face, okay? But, you know, they had their rules. You can't be like Mystico, the only luchador to ever win wrestler of the year. Like, God forbid, because he's short and he speaks the actual language of the... Anyway, so they got this Alberto bloke, and he's tall, and he's handsome, and he speaks English, right up their wheelhouse. But of course, he has to be a heel because the only way they know how to get anybody over is you're a heel for a long time, and then eventually, you know, we'll turn you babyface. So if you guys remember his babyface turn, it was like he was a heel, and then they teased it, and the fans got excited, and then they made him a heel again. And then they teased it, and the fans got excited, and they went back again. And by the time they turned this guy babyface, nobody cared. It didn't work. Because the presumption was, ah, God, we've seen it a million times. You can go too long. You can drag it out to the point where people don't care anymore. And sometimes it works, 
and sometimes it doesn't. So there is no trust the process. There is no let it play out. Yeah, we should let the Julia Hart thing play out because maybe it's going to work. But, bro, last night was, was to me, <laughs> one time way too many. It should have happened yesterday. Now I'm over it. Am I the only one? Do you so. remember how they decided to get uh, Alberto Del Rio over as well? No. The Christmas episode where he ran over Mick Foley as Santa. That's right. That was the jump start. The next week he was a fully vested baby face. Uh, you know, somebody else made a good comment, too, that uh, I didn't think about. But uh, oh, I was going to talk about uh, Ray Phoenix and Dante Martin. Well, I, luckily there's a Brian and Vinny show tonight. But uh, they, they were pointing out that they made a really big deal on the show about the uh, the Britt Baker match. They're doing the tag match on uh, on Rampage, and they made this big deal about how it'll be the first ever women's match to open Rampage, which actually is a big deal because you know at the time that Rampage airs, the op- opening segment is always the highest rated thing on the show. It's like the old Saturday night's main events. The main event kind of goes first because people watch the main event and they fall asleep, go to bed, whatever. And so it's like a big deal that this women's match is going on first. But then somebody pointed out, bro, the show airs at 2.30 in the afternoon on the West Coast. They would be way better off going last. But too late. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also WrestlingObserver.com. You made it! Brandon, uh, Brandon Thurston put the uh, dynamite readings out. 833,000. Uh, and a .32. It's, it's dead. Back and, it up. Uh, you know, so if you ever go on my Twitter and post these numbers, like there, it's just <laughs> madness and a bunch of idiots being idiots. But every now and then, like someone who I believe is like totally sincere will just write this missive. And it'll be like... God, I'm so depressed. I just love wrestling. And it's so sad to see that it might actually be heading towards its demise. Like, they're they're totally sincere. And I'm like, bro, it's the NBA. Like, I just don't get how you can be on Twitter and not have any idea what's going on with these. You know what, you know what Rampage is going to do on Friday, right everybody? There. Rampage is going to do, like... If it breaks 300, if it breaks like into the 400s, like they should throw a party. It's probably going to be in the 300s. It's going to do a horrible, horrible number, okay? Raw's doing poorly. SmackDown did its all-time lowest demo on Fox. This show got killed. Only old people are watching. And I mean, dude, Look, it's going to happen until the, the NBA playoffs are over. You're Quit exactly right. being depressed. I know. But two things also can be true because there is, as we mentioned, AEW being in the 40s. Obviously, they have a lot younger fan base to kind of go off of. But it is important, no matter who you are, no matter what wrestling that you like, you know, wrestling continue to expand, get bigger. I mean, again, there are too many people that are still left over from the Hulk Hogan era of being fans. Like, that does absolutely need to get younger. Wrestling across the board needs to find a way to reach out and to grow. It does. That's actually true. Out of time, everybody. I'm going back to bed. We'll talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live.